Welcome to Closer to Venus. Today's guest is Michelle Grenberg. She is a meditation and mindfulness teacher, a past life regression therapist, and among other things, a shamanic practitioner. Michelle, welcome to Closer to Venus. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Johnny. Thanks for inviting me. How did you get onto this spiritual existential track, if you will? Well, you know, it's one of those things that sort of finds you. Mm -hmm. It really is one of those things that feels like it was just etched into my blueprint. I was going to come to it regardless. And like anything else, it came from my own passion and my own exploration started with meditation. I, if I could point to anything, it was the day that I learned meditation, that I was introduced to meditation mm -hmm. and had a direct experience in meditation that for me was powerful and profound. It felt like an experience where I was connecting directly with something bigger than me, something outside of me and something within me. And it, that experience just launched me more, more, more exploration, 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 eventually through that, then becoming from the learner, soaking it in, becoming the mm -hmm. teacher. That's sort of that natural progression. Hey, can I learn how to do this with others? Things like teach meditation, things like do past life regression. You read a book and you're like, wow, the wow factor. And then you're like, can I do this as service? And I've just always been about helping people. Just always been about doing service. It's just Excellent. who I am. Excellent. So the meditation yeah. was the first trigger. And I can imagine how meditation can open up complete worlds for people on a different level of consciousness, right? Yes. It's a That's door. Part. It's a portal. Mm -hmm. So do you think that through conscious decisions, say, I'm going to meditate, I'm going to get a teacher, I'm going to learn how to do it proper, or those people who accidentally kind of stumble into it, do you think they can actually access past life memories without even deliberately trying to do so? It's absolutely, the answer is yes. It's in the realm of possibility. Is it probable? Is it probable or likely? For most people, no. For a small percentage, they have spontaneous memories. They don't, might not even know their memories though. They might not even have a frame of reference or a language for what they experience in meditation, but but it definitely will lead them somewhere. And, and for me, I didn't necessarily have a language for it either, but it was a felt sense of something. But yeah, the idea with past life regression is that's a deliberate, intentful way of helping you remember your past lives. But they're your memories, so technically right. they're stored. There's nothing mystical or mysterious about the fact that we've lived many, many, many past lives, and that every single one of those memories are not lost to you. You do not have amnesia. They're encoded within you. It's the story of you as a soul, as an eternal being. So how could it not be anywhere else other than within you and also stored in the collection? So absolutely, people have those spontaneous experiences. Maybe just they might just get triggered by a sound or a smell or, or a movie or a book. Or meditation may allow for it. The filters go down. The memories are already there. They're not outside of you. They're there. They're in you. It reminds me of when I was in college. I forget where I was. We were probably on our way to a bar or something. And I went down to tie my shoe. And my friend said, I just had deja vu when you did that. Of course, I thought nothing more of like, when's my next beer going to be in my hand? But I look back on that, moments like that, and I think, what did that actually mean? And when you mention storing memories... Does that have to do with the Akashic records or is that a different element altogether? Our past life memories exist on many different levels, in many different ways, in many different dimensions, because they are really are non-local. They really are vibrations or energy traces in that way. So we could say that past life memories exist from the psychological model, we say the subconscious mind. Our past lives is memory recall. Regression is memory recall. Our past mm -hmm. lives are stored in our subconscious. But we could also say they're in our soul memory, a higher level of knowledge. It's more mm -hmm. so from the soul's knowledge. And then collectively, since we really are one, it's not even just like a cute saying. It's not a cliche to say we're all connected. We are one. We are one entity. We are one organism. We are one mind. And so the collective ensemble of all of our memories are we would say stored in the Akashic records. It's just a label we put on this thing that's very hard to describe, but mm -hmm. easier for us to understand it by saying it's like a vast library. So it's where all souls memory, the, the long memory 
the, the, the whole spectrum of memory of every life that every soul has ever lived, every thought that soul ever had, whether conscious or unconscious, every emotion, every act, every deed, every interaction, every single everything leaves an impression that we can all access. And then it is all stored and adding up, adding up, adding up, adding up to the expansion and the evolution of us as this ever evolving organism that is really moving and navigating the material world together. Mm -hmm. We're actually navigating it together. And every time I have a new thought, a more leading edge evolved thought, it adds on to the ever growing, expanding ness of who we are. Now, the oneness that you spoke of, which is probably the butt of many jokes with people who may not be the yeah. most enlightened souls in the world, but nonetheless, they can't really grasp it. And then you run into that other roadblock, which we call religion, because sometimes when I talk to people about these kind of topics, even though they want to believe in reincarnation and past lives and so on, they can't really reconcile that with the religious upbringing. Catholic, just like most people in the Northeast, Catholic, Christian, whatever. How can you describe this to somebody in very simple terms, or can you even do it? The oneness that is. Yeah, oneness. I, I can understand why it's challenging for people to grasp the concept because it forces us out of our linear thinking and it forces us out of our physical senses. Mm -hmm. And it forces us, it invites us to move beyond our intellect and it invites us to move beyond our conditioning. And religion basically is a belief system that mm -hmm. often people are indoctrinated into very early on. And so it's like a ceiling though. I mean, religion offers value, but if you're looking at it as the answer to everything can be found in my particular religion, well, that's silly in the sense that it's arbitrary. What if you were raised another religion? Then you'd believe that belief system. Mm -hmm. If you're raised in this religion, you believe this belief system. And it doesn't mean you have to throw it all away, but it really means in order to understand oneness, it's more about spirituality than it is about religion, but it's really more about existence. It's about taking a zoomed out view instead of zooming in, you know, and, and that's what leads us into these larger conversations. I like that expression, zoom out. That seems to be related to the description of a panoramic view of events when people have that NDE, the near-death experience where they see everything at once, but at the same time, the concept of time is much different in that space. It definitely is a hard concept for a lot of us to grasp, but it seems like someone could make the argument that every one of these people are me in a certain sense, but that's when you start to think in a linear fashion, it starts to get really confusing. Yeah, it absolutely does. And so I tend to trust that each individual soul on their journey sort of comes to these larger concepts, these broader concepts when they're ready. They might not even realize they're ready, but they're poised on the verge of readiness. And otherwise they just won't find them. They won't even stumble across them. They'll zig while these concepts zag. You know, it's that sort of law of attraction type of universal principle that when we're vibrating at a certain level, we find the knowledge that vibrates and matches that particular level. But I would say that this dream that we call life is more of a dream that consciousness is having. Nonetheless, just like when we fall asleep at night and we're in our dream world and we're immersed in it, we're immersed in this dream the same way. We can become lucid and then not lucid. But because people are so mm. immersed in the dream as if it is real and it's awfully lifelike, it's very, very lifelike. This earth reality that we're dreaming together is very lifelike. I can understand why they can't break out of because they don't even realize that there is anything other beyond the walls and constructs of this reality. But it's like there was an experiment where they put a bunch of fleas into a jar and they had a lid on the jar with some holes in it. And the fleas were in there for a very, very, very long time. And mm -hmm. even when they took the lid off, right. this is us. Even when they took the lid off, they had no concept that there was anything beyond that lid, that there was any reality beyond that lid. So they still just stayed in that jar. And that's a really good analogy, you know, for us, we don't know what we don't know until we have this maybe breakthrough moment. We're only limited by our minds, by the conditioning and by the belief systems that we buy into. 
And when you say this life versus once you get to that space, this one's a dream, this one's more real, sounds an awful lot like many near-death experiences where that person basically says, when I was in that space, that was much more real than the experience on earth. Most people have it backwards. <laughs> the experience on earth was actually much more like a dream. It sounds very similar. Is that the same thing that you're talking about? Yeah, isn't it ironic? And isn't it deliciously ironic that people who have NDE, where they die, quote unquote, and you would think mm -hmm. it's like it, it's an ending. <laughs> it's a beginning. It's, it's a transition, right? And people report feeling more alive, more alive on the other side beyond Incredible. death than they do in this life. It's just like this life is muted and gray. It's limited, and, what, and we, we tend to say it's dense. It's a dense reality. We have gravity. We have to walk around from places. Yeah, we have to compete <laughs> for the trophy wife or the trophy husband or the trophy job. It gets to be, oh, is this all there is? Well, we've we? created these rules. It, it's like minutiae. It, everything seems so trivial and, and superficial. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It just is what it is. But near-death experiences, if we can learn anything from that, it is that we have pure freedom, that the soul itself is so much more than we give it credit. Anything we can say about the soul, it's much more than that. And the experience of what we call the afterlife, which mm -hmm. is really just awakening to your true essence, it's not really a before or after because technically birth is not a beginning. Therefore, death is not an ending. It's a continuum. Is it Total, not? eternal, eternal, eternal continuum. Again, right. these are these are concepts that people, if you're being introduced to them for the first time, you're going to look for comparisons and you have to be a free thinker. You have to seek to be a real independent thinker in order to, to begin to just embrace these ideas. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the differences or should I say the parallels between the near-death experiences and the past life regression. One of the things that I've noticed in a lot of the readings and experiences is that when people die clinically for however long that takes and they meet up with their past loved ones, friends, family, it seems to be that many of them seem younger and they're in their prime when they see them on the other side. Is there similar experiences in the past life regression sessions or is that something completely different? Well, there's some crossover, definitely. You know, with near-death experiences, I do believe that our experience on the afterlife still runs through a filter of familiarity. We mm -hmm. tend to carry over into that experience almost what we expect to be there, almost what we design to be there. And then I also believe that in each life that we live, we blueprint our death in, in some ways as well. But when it comes to past life regression, remember, it's memory recall. And so you straddle two worlds in past life regression, two awarenesses, not worlds, I should say, two awarenesses. You're having this memory that's unfolding very much like a movie or like snapshots, or sometimes it's more sensory or it's more of feelings that arise. And yet parallel to that, at exactly that same moment as well, you're aware of that, that it is a memory. You're in an observer mode, mm -hmm. right? So you're aware that this individual that I'm experiencing that I feel so strongly is me. And yet here I am, I am me. And that is me. And that is similar to a near death experience in it's some not, ways. It, it sounds <laughs> like it is. Like he said, you did a good job of explaining how you're in observer mode. Because of recalled memories with the NDE, you might actually see relatives and friends that have passed and the council of elders where you get to judge yourself. They don't judge you. You get to see how you did. You grade yourself on the past life, which brings us to another subject, which could be a discussion for another day. But when we talk about near-death experiences and past lives, then there's that realm of lives between lives. And you were trained by Brian Weiss, correct? I was. Yeah. And so that for me was a game changer because I went from believing, well, oh, I think reincarnation is real to no, I know it's real. You can't really ignore it. Here's a quick example. I was watching one of the Gaia shows. I think it was Beyond Belief where Richard Martini described a sequence where this man meets some of his past, you know, his relatives and friends that have passed and people he liked. And he also met some people he didn't like. And one of them was his uncle. And when he finally gets to talk to this uncle figure and he says, don't you remember? We agreed on this. And when I learned about that, I thought people really need to know this. And I can't do enough to really push this forward. You can't really tell enough people about this because it gives them 
hope that it's not over. There is no black screen when you die. It keeps going. Of course, there's ramifications too. And that's the next question I want to ask you. What happens when someone goes through this process and they realize that they're accountable for their actions? What do the listeners need to know about that? What I want people to know because sometimes this is what I don't want to say scares people away from trying regression when it can be such a powerful experience. One of the misconceptions is I don't want to unlock that box because what if I've done something shameful? We're so conditioned to believe that there is punishment and that it's possible to be a victim. So it really does turn everything on its ear in terms of the way that we view how powerful we're really the the way that we really are in the world. And so karma, you know, and by design is for our highest good so that we can have a direct experience of how we affect others and how we affect ourselves through that circle. I think what it really does come down to is because there's so many components here. There's near-death experiences, there's past lives, there's lives in between lives, there's the Kashik records, there's karma. And I'm wondering with all these things, we could even talk about the nature of the soul. Is there some kind of roadmap where we can get an understanding about how it works? My feeling is this. I had a discussion with someone actually earlier today about the Chicago gangsters, and it reminded me of yet another discussion I had where we talk about karma and our feeling is bad behavior is not free. You have to pay for it at some point. Can we expect that if we go through life killing people and just taking advantage of them and treating them poorly, that we're not just going to be able to keep doing that over and over again, because at some point we need to atone for it. But some people say, yes, whatever pain you inflicted on people, you're going to experience that next life. Whereas other people in the space that have done the work like you have, that have done the research, that have interviewed countless people. There are those that think, no, they don't necessarily have to atone for it, but they're going to be stuck in the same karmic circle over and over again until they learn that they need to do better. And then they can finally start to progress spiritually. You know, I think that's why it's important to sort of be conscious and to take responsibility, certainly. So if someone is very unconscious in their life and they're just sort of never considering that they're responsible for their actions and their words and their energy in the world, then most likely they keep having these sort of vicious cycle types of experiences that keep Mm -hmm. folding back for them that are trying to nudge them and push them to make different choices. The other way to clear that karma from the past is to just be aware of that entire concept, that universal concept, that once again, we are one. So what I do to you, I'm really doing to myself. You are a mirror for me. What what we do to others, we're really, because there's only us. Mm -hmm. There's no you and me, technically. There isn't. There is only us. And so that's what karma really is. It's that cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And so things will continually, continually, continually reap what we sow until we maybe make a more intentful decision to let me live my life from a space of kindness. If I am kind to others, then that will be the experience that will be returned to me. When we talk about forgiveness from a small level, we think of forgiveness like you've done something wrong, someone's done you wrong, and now we have to bring some forgiveness into that. But forgiveness is really more that clearing dynamic that releasing dynamic of we're not tied to our past. Right. It's a great description of how you tie in the oneness to the karma, whatever you do to others, you're basically doing to yourself. The way I try to understand that is you can either get stuck on the wheel of karma or you can step off and get onto the wheel of grace where you don't have to hit the other person back and you forgive them and release it and just keep going. Yeah, Um, it's it's not a tit for tat type of thing. You know, it's not that black and white in that way. But I would say to people, if you really want to create a trajectory where your life starts to show up in in a way that you absolutely love it, you can do something like just meditate for five minutes a day, like a loving kindness type of meditation. I think that that higher vibration that we create when we sit and have a meditation that, that is just connecting to our heart and remembering that our heart is connected to the collective heart. That's going to what we call kind of clear karma right? It's paving a whole new ripple of energy that's going to now go forward and bring about something. Thoughts become things. Everything we think about, can, we can bring about when we focus on it. Can you walk us through one of your cases with a client where they came to you and 
had these issues and started to express interest in past life therapy or PLR therapy, which is, I believe, what you call it, how it works, a snapshot of what we can expect for those people that are thinking about doing that. Yes, I can give you kind of a general sense of typically the way that it goes. Past life regression therapy is really a healing modality in my mind. It is where a trained professional like myself helps you to set an intention of what you'd like to learn from your past life memories. And then I lead you into just a sort of light state of trance, really just a state of relaxation or a meditative state, because that allows people to uh, move beyond resistance move beyond struggle and allow for those memories to bubble up to the surface. So just some simple meditative and hypnotic types of techniques to set the stage for that, to create an atmosphere and a state that's conducive for you to have, for you to allow for those memories to arise to the surface. And then, as I said, you're able to straddle that relaxed state and be conscious enough to report the memories as they are occurring, almost like you're watching a movie and you're reporting that movie. And then I can help to move someone along through the experience. And, you know, 99% of the time, people are absolutely able to recover these memories. And they surprise themselves. The memories can be like little vague snapshots. In Brian Weiss's books, of course, the, the stories are very drawn out. They're very colorful. They're very vivid. And they have a really logical beginning, middle, and end. And there's lots and lots of insights and ways that people connect the dots. We always are able to bring a summary. We're able to review that past life and connect it to this life perfectly. It always works out that way, but it might not be as exciting or sexy <laughs> as <laughs> the stories that are in the books, because they put the very best stories in the book so that they make really good reading. So most of the time people will describe past lives that are fairly, I don't want to say ordinary because every life is precious. Every life is unique, just like this life. But for the most part, people tend to report, here's where I lived. Here was my family. Here's an experience where I was abandoned by my mm -hmm. parents. Here's an experience where I fell. Here's an experience where I stole from someone. Here's an experience where I lived on the street. Here's an experience where I hurt someone. Here's an experience where I was in love, but it wasn't reciprocated. All the kinds of things that we go through in this life, the many, many mm -hmm. types of things that we call the issues and hurdles of this life. But when we see it, view it as a past life, we're, we're positioned, again, more higher vantage point. We're all we're positioning ourselves like higher perspective. Here is this life. I'm reviewing this life. Now, the opportunity is such an incredible opportunity with my assistance or with a professional's assistant to help you to, and really it's intuition. A lot of it is intuition, but it winds up being fairly logical. It l winds up being like so obvious what mm -hmm. the connections are between that past life that they're reporting and their current life. Like the patterns come through. The patterns are similar. The, the beliefs that we're still holding oh my goodness, I can see where those beliefs originate. And, and that's where we trust our subconscious to always present the perfect memory. It's never random. It's never an, an accidental memory. It's a memory that somehow perfectly aligns like a puzzle piece mm -hmm. with this life in such a way that you get the greatest learning. You find that many of your patients are able to recall many of these with, sounds like very crystal clear clarity in some cases. Yeah. The first time, I, I believe it's like a muscle that we build once someone has the experience and then they feel confident in the fact mm -hmm. it's not a skill. It's something we naturally can do, but it's just like meditation. The more you practice it, you deepen mm -hmm. the experience. But for the most part, it is very, very rare when someone has absolutely no experience. Now, the experience they have might be just a, just the tip of the iceberg, and each time, again, deeper and deeper and deeper, and they have a more expanded experience. But yeah, that's what occurs. They can see some detail, some detail, and other parts of it are not very detailed, or they just have a, a, a sense. I imagine that's going to differ on a case-by-case -case basis. Have you had any of your clients actually go to the extent of trying to verify who they were in a past life or several past lives? Occasionally, I do have clients who will do that because they're very right brain intellectual and they want that proof or they're just curious. It's not that they need the proof. They're just curious. I love when they, they circle back to me and say that they did some research on the Internet and they really it helps to validate the experience. I found pictures on the Internet. I found descriptions on the Internet that really match my experience. And at least I know it's true enough 
to facts, to facts and figures, and historically, it's mm -hmm. possible. There's no book to look it up in to find ourselves, you know, exactly, unless you get that level of detail. Usually, people aren't really looking for it. They more want the catharsis that a past life memory offers, the emotional release. There's a wonderful book, though, if people like that type of aspect of it, how to look it up by Jenny Coquel called Across Time and Death, A Mother's Search for Her Past Life Children. It's a fascinating, fascinating story about a woman who remembered a past life, remembered her children in a past life to such detail that she was actually able to find her birth certificate by Jenny Coquel, C-O-C-K-E-L-L. And there's other books similar, but her book stands out to me. And Brian Weiss always recommends it. That sounds really, really cool. Those are the things that if I take the plunge, which eventually someone's probably going to talk me into it, I want to know what I look like in the past life. What did I do? And I think it would be pretty incredible to see a picture if you could verify it, because I've also come across many people who say there are physical similarities between myself and that person I supposedly was in a life before. Thanks for bringing that up. That's definitely yet another book that's going to be on my reading list. So <laughs> The um, ever-growing reading list. And it is. It, it's probably going to take me 20 years to read all these books. If you met someone in an elevator and you told them what you did and you're on the first floor and they, they're getting off at like floor seven, what would you tell them in your elevator pitch of the main takeaways of your work? I would say that my work is like spiritual psychotherapy, you know, where we explore the past to help us have a better today and a better tomorrow. I would say that there's much more to who they are than meets the eye and that our subconscious mind or our soul's memory holds detailed records of that. When I assist someone that they are able to sort of tap into levels of their mind. And we barely use even the tiniest portion of our mind. I would bet money on that. That's absolutely true. Again, a great description. So Michelle, how can our listeners find you online? My website is michellegranberg.com. Everything mm -hmm. that they need is really there. All your links, all your social links and so forth. And you have a TV show as well. I do have a TV show that airs on local cable access here in New Jersey. It's also archived on YouTube and Vimeo. It's called Positive Energy TV. So people can certainly search by my name, Michelle Granberg, or and or Positive Energy TV. And I talk about these types of topics and so much more. Awesome. Michelle, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to put all your links in the show notes so our listeners can take advantage of that. You've been listening to the Closer to Venus podcast. I'm Johnny Burke. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.